rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. In 2 Timothy 1.7, God says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Okay, God didn't give us a spirit of fear. God gave us a spirit of power. In fact, most of us know Psalm 23. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But that one passage where it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. The whole idea is the presence of God should take the fear out of our lives. Fear doesn't come from God. The only time in Scripture where, where we're commanded to fear is when we come in the presence of God himself. Um, and having a healthy fear and reverence for God. But um, I, I was thinking about this series, and I've been uh, studying this, this passage in Luke, and it's been so good for me because I realize I, I still struggle with fear. There are many times in my life I struggle with fear, and it's been so good just realizing, you know what, I'm not supposed to. I'm not supposed to be scared. I still get nervous coming up here. I get nervous getting in front of a car. I got nervous this Wednesday night in front of our junior high group. I thought, man, I don't want to speak too much of junior hires, you know. And just the fear, and, I, and, and just the last couple of weeks, I think of several of my speaking engagements where I thought, man, they flew me all the way out of here, and what if I mess up? What if I don't really have anything to say? And, and all these feelings of fear and just recognizing, wait a second, I am not supposed to feel any of this. God is going to enable me to do whatever he's called me to do. And yet, how many times in life have we backed away from something that maybe God was calling us to, some sort of mission, some sort of challenge, and we just go, ah, not me, I'm not able to do it. And that's why in this passage, what you see is Jesus, as he sends his disciples out, he tells them, look, I'm giving you the power to do what I'm asking you to do. Yet, do we live with that kind of confidence? Do you live with the confidence every day that you have the power to do whatever God calls you to do? We're going to talk about getting rid of our fears these next few weeks. And, um, well, you know what? Let's, let's do this. I, you know, I've been praying. I've been praying for myself, just saying, God, you know, I, I want to live the rest of my life without fear. I would love that. I would just love to just be confident in everything I do, knowing you're present with me, knowing that there's nothing to fear. And so I've been praying that prayer. And, and I would just ask you right now uh, just to pray that God, over the next few weeks, as we talk about this issue through Scripture, that God would speak to you and that God would help you get rid of any fears you have in life. So would you just bow your heads right now and just, just spend a minute praying to God and asking God to speak to you about this issue. Father, help us to become people who fear you alone, nothing else. Help us to know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. God, just teach us. Show us in our lives the areas where we're backing down, where we're weak. And give us the power, Lord. Help us to see that, that that's the spirit you put in us. Not a timid one, but one of power. And help us to claim that power believe in it and live fearlessly for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 9. For those who are, who are new and, you know, hopefully you got a Bible on the way in, there's, there's Bibles out in the, the lobby as you come in. If, you ever, if I ever say turn to a book and you don't know where it is, just turn to the front of the Bible, there's a little table of contents and you can just kind of figure it out and believe me, you're not the only one, so don't be embarrassed. Um, people here aren't as spiritual as they look. Um, Luke chapter 9. We've been studying the book of Luke, and uh, we've been studying the life of Jesus. And, and, and thus far, we've been studying all these public things that Jesus has been doing. Jesus has been uh, addressing crowds. He's been pouring miracles in, in public. 
But here in Luke chapter 9, his ministry time takes a, a change. He kind of shifts gears here. And he, his ministry from here on out is not so much to the masses, but to his 12 disciples. This is where he begins to concentrate and focus on these 12 followers of his and really build that into their lives so that they can multiply his ministry when he leaves the earth. And that's what we see here in chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1 says, When Jesus called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So here in Luke chapter 9, Jesus gets his 12 disciples together and he sends them on a mission. And he tells them, I want you to go out and preach the kingdom of God. I want you to go out and start preaching. I mean, at this point, the disciples had just been following Jesus around, watching Jesus heal people. They've been seeing all the miracles, seeing the power of God. And now Jesus says, I want you to go out. And here in this passage, he is specifically telling them to go out to the Jews, to Israel. And, uh, and, and you can read that in, when you study the par parallel passage in Matthew chapter 10 that Jesus says, go out to the lost sheep of Israel. Go, go speak to, to Israel. And so they are supposed to be going out and telling people about the kingdom of God. Now, when it says preach the kingdom of God, in, uh, in the book of Daniel, in the Old Testament, okay, they would have already been familiar with the kingdom of God. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it talks about how God was going to rule and God was going to have his kingdom. They were familiar with kingdoms because they, had, uh, they knew about the Babylonian Empire. You know, there was the Medo-Persian Empire. There was the, uh, the, the Greek Empire and then the Roman Empire, you know, that they were, they were right in the middle of right then. And so what, what Daniel says is one day that this Messiah was going to come and he was going to set up his kingdom. Okay, this was a kingdom that was going to last forever. And so what he's telling the disciples to do now, he says, okay, go out and start telling the Jews that you know that kingdom we've been waiting for, the kingdom of God, it's here. Start preaching the kingdom of God. Start preaching about this kingdom, that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was here. And so he, he tells them to go out. Now, that's a, that's a tough thing to teach. I mean, imagine, you know, these people had been waiting. They've been waiting for this Messiah. They've been waiting for this ruler to come. And now the, the disciples are supposed to go out in the world and convince the world that the Messiah is here. And they know who he is. The kingdom of God is here. Okay, imagine what that would be like. Because remember, there had been no real prophets for about 400 years. Okay, 400 years, you've heard nothing. You know, but you've got this Old Testament, you know, and this book of Daniel that talks about that this kingdom is going to come. And now imagine you're one of the 12 people that's supposed to go out into the world now and convince them that the kingdom of God is here. Okay, that's, a, that's a pretty difficult task. It's kind of a scary task. And that's why Jesus, he explains, look, he, he's going to give them power and authority to drive out demons and cure diseases. He says, look, I'm going to empower you to do this. See, just like the reason why Jesus was, was listened to by the people was because he had such power. He's raising people from the dead. He's casting demons out of people. He's healing people. So they had a reason to listen to him. And Jesus is saying, since I'm sending you out on this task, I'm going to give you this power. I'm going to empower you. I'm going to give you the power and the authority to go out. And you're going to be able to do the same things I've been doing. We've been studying Jesus doing these things. Now he's telling his disciples, you're going to go out and do the same thing so that people will listen to you. Which brings up the point that, you know, when God asks us to do, you know, different tasks, he's going to empower us to do them. And I'm not saying he's going to give us the ability to perform miracles or whatever it may be, but he has called us to go out to spread his word. And he has promised us the same Holy Spirit that those, those disciples were given. And the Bible explains that the, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, it says in John 16, 8, that the Holy Spirit would convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And the Holy Spirit came down on the earth. He would convince other people. And, and I was reminded of this, you know, even, even Wednesday night, I, you know, I was, I was just in the multi-purpose room, speaking to junior hires. And, and there's fear when I talk to junior hires. I, you know what I mean? I mean, you get a couple of junior hires in a room, it will scare anyone. And, uh, and I just thought, no, you know what? God, you have called me to go in there and just speak. And your word says that I don't have to convict them. 
that it's the Holy Spirit, that he's on the earth to convict those students. And I just spent the time in prayer saying, God, you know, there's going to be all these students that are coming that don't know you, that don't have a relationship with you. Our junior high ministry is, is cranking. There's all sorts of things going on. But, but, you know, I was like, Lord, you know what? You're the one that has to convince them. I mean, I have no power in myself. I can't go up there and manipulate someone into believing in Jesus. I said, God, you're going to have to do it. And sure enough, I got up there, no jokes, nothing, just got up and, and, and preached the gospel to a few hundred junior high students. And 66 of them gave their lives to the Lord for the first time. And, uh, it has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with this, this power of how am I going to do this, but the confidence of, you know what, Lord? You say your Holy Spirit's going to convict. You say that's what he comes in the world to do. And uh, in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he tells his disciples, you know what, stay here in Jerusalem. Wait until the Holy Spirit comes, because when he comes, you'll receive power. And then you'll be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. He, he says, you know what, just wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit. He is going to do the work through you. And it's this belief that God's Spirit dwells in us and enables us to do these things. That's what enabled these, these disciples. He sends them out to preach the kingdom of God, to heal the, heal the sick, and they were able to do it. Do you believe that you have the power to do anything that God calls you to do? See, that phrase has been in my mind all week. I can do anything God wants me to do. I can do anything God wants me to do. Do you believe that? Why don't you say that out loud with me? I can do anything God wants me to do. Say it again. I can do anything God wants me to do. Is that how you live your life? With that type of confidence? When you wake up in the morning and go, you know what? I can do anything God wants me to do. Because if he calls me on a mission, he's going to empower me just like he did the disciples. He's not going to ask me something that he doesn't give me the ability to do. And so why do I fear? Why do I get afraid? Is it because I don't really believe that I can do certain things? It's been awesome just, just living this week, even though it's only been a week, but just confidence of, you know what? I can be a dad. I can be a good husband. I can be a good pastor. You know, I, I, can, I can help the people in Africa. I can help people in the inner city. I can do whatever God's called me to do. Wherever he asks me to speak, I can stand up there with confidence, knowing that, you know, if God asks me to do it, I can do it. Man, do you live with that type of confidence? And, and understand, it doesn't mean that I wake up in the morning and I, I look in the mirror and go, wow, you're one good-looking guy. You can, you can go out and conquer the world, handsome. You know, I mean, it's not this, uh, you know, it's not like I, I sit there and go, wow, you have such power. People love you, you know, and, and, you know, work myself into this frenzy. No, it's this idea that, no, God's spirit, you know, to look in the mirror and say, you know what the Bible says? that his very spirit dwells in me, okay? He lives in me. God lives in me, and I can do anything that he's called me to do. Just like he empowered them, he empowers me. Do you believe that, that God's Holy Spirit lives in you? For those of you who believe in Jesus Christ. It goes on in verse 3, and, and this is interesting, because as he sends them out, look what he says in verse 3. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. Okay, he's basically telling them, he's got his 12 disciples, and he's telling them as he gathers them around, go right now. He's saying, don't go back to the house and grab a staff. Don't go back to the house and, you know, pack, you know, the bag was the idea of luggage. Don't go pack in your suitcase. I don't want you taking anything. Don't go back to your house to get money. Just go. Isn't that interesting? He's telling these 12 disciples, I mean, they could have just run home real quick and grabbed a few things. You'd think that would help them, but God says, I don't want you caught up in having a bunch of stuff. You've got to trust me that you have enough right now. And you know what? I tell you, this is, this is an important point because I think a lot of times, some of us in this room, we feel called by God to do certain things here on this earth. But we just go, not yet, because I don't have enough yet. I'm not secure enough until the future. Wait, wait a little longer. Wait till I store up a little bit more, and then I'll be ready to go. And Jesus says, just go. 
If I've asked you to do something, I'll provide for you. Just go. I don't even want you going back and getting your walking stick. Trust me. I'll give you the power to go however far you need to go. Don't get money. Don't get food. Nothing for your journey. No bag. Just go. You know, uh, it, it seems like what Jesus wanted of his disciples was for them to have to live by faith. He was making them totally dependent on him. I mean, think about it. He's asking you, let's say he gathered you and 11 of your friends and paired you up and says, just start going to these cities. Just go with nothing. God's got to come through at that point, doesn't he? He has to come through. See, God was putting him in a situation where God had to come through. What we want is the exact opposite. We want to put ourselves in situations to where even if God doesn't come through, I'll still be okay. Right? Isn't that how we live our lives? We're, we're trying to build the security for ourselves so that even if God doesn't come through, we'll be okay. And what Jesus says to them is, I don't want you in that position. I want you dependent on me for the rest of your lives. I want you to go out. I want you on this one mission just to have nothing at all. Just go out and do what I tell you to do. No bag, no bread, no money, no extra clothes, just with a shirt on your back. Go. And then look at verse 4 when he says, Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. Why did he say that? Whatever house you enter, if they let you stay there, he said, just stay there until you leave the town. You understand better when you read the book of Luke or, or the book of Matthew in the same passage. But the reason why Jesus said that was he didn't want them to have the tendency of going to one house and then someone else invites them to their house and go, ooh, this house is a little nicer. I'll go to this one. And then you find another one. You know, a richer guy says, well, you can stay in my house. You'll have your own room, a bathroom, everything. Oh, okay. Hey, you know what? I'm going to leave your house and go to the next house. The idea is whatever you have, be content with it. How much time do we waste going from one house to another? Going, ah, oh, you know what? I, I like this house God gave me, but here's an opportunity for a better one. And a better one. And a better one. And we just keep going. We keep moving what we call up, you know, and getting better and better. And Jesus says, you know what? Don't preoccupy yourself with all this stuff. Wherever I put you, just be happy there. You know, whatever house you enter in that city, just stay in that one house. Don't keep trying to upgrade. There's more important things. You can't busy your time trying to improve your living situation if you want to go on this mission that I've asked you to go on. Then he goes on, and, uh, you know, I, let me just ask you, you know what? For those of you who feel like you're not quite ready to start uh, really going after some ministry opportunities in your life, when will you be ready? Have you established that? Have you thought that through? When will you be ready? When will you have enough? It's a real important question to ask yourself. You know, if you're not ready now, when will you be? Because most likely, if you're, you're not ready and you don't feel like you have enough, you'll never have enough. That's, that's what contentment's all about, is when you understand, when you can be content with what you have, you know what, that's the only time you'll be content. If you have to do something or get somewhere or earn something in order to be content, you never will be. Paul says, I've learned the secret. I can be content with a lot of stuff or with nothing, next to nothing. Verse 5. He says, if people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. That sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? Yeah, so go out just with whatever you have, wherever you, you know, if someone lets you in their house, just stay in their house. But if people reject you, he says, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. He's saying expect rejection. There's going to be some of this. And, and this is another reason why we don't like to go out and tell people about Jesus is the fear of rejection. You know, it's not the fear that we won't please God because just by going out and doing it, we please God. Our fear is we don't please people all the time. And Jesus is telling his disciples that's just going to happen. And this idea of shaking the dust off your feet, this is what the Jews used to do whenever they would go into a Gentile territory. Okay, when they were leaving that territory, they would literally shake the dust off of their feet before they walked back into their own land so they don't defile their land with the dirt 
from this other, this other nation, from a Gentile nation that didn't believe in God. And so now you've got the disciples going to these homes of the Jews, and if they were rejecting what they were teaching, they themselves would shake the dust off, off of this Jewish person's house as they left. You, you can imagine, that's a, that was a pretty uh, harsh statement toward them. See, because the Jews were saying it to the Gentiles, they were saying, look, you are not a part of us. You've rejected our God, and so we shake the dust off our feet as we move back into our land. And now the disciples are preaching the kingdom of God and pre preaching this Messiah that has come. And uh, when the Jews reject them, they shake the dust off their feet and say, you're not a part of us. You've rejected the kingdom of God. Now, um, that sounds pretty rude, doesn't it? Let me, let me share a couple thoughts on this, though. A couple things we learn from this. First of all, there's a time to move on. Okay? Remember when Jesus cast those demons out of that man, you know, the naked man, and, and all the demons went in those pigs, and then the people said, Jesus, get out. Did Jesus stay in that region? No, he got out. He didn't stay there and force himself upon those people. He just got out. There's a time to leave. There's a time when they've rejected the gospel, when they've rejected the truth, and you just move on to people who want to hear it. But another thing is that's important that we learn from here is, you know what, it's it's important when we tell people about what we believe and they reject it, it is important that they know that they've rejected something. Okay? To, to make it clear. They, Jesus wanted them to make a statement, to make it clear, you know what, you have rejected something. It's not that we don't love them. L listen, for, for some of you in this room, you, you, you come week after week, and some of you still have not made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. Okay, you still sit here, and some of you in this room, as I talk about Jesus, even bring up his name, you go, I don't really believe in him. And, and that's, that's, that's fine, okay? And I care about you, I love you, but I also want to make clear that there is a distinction between you and I. That there's a, there's a difference in opinion, there's a difference in a belief system. And it's a big difference. You see, I believe, and many of us in this room believe, that we have done things that are offensive to God. That God looks at us and says, you know what? You haven't obeyed my commands. Now, some of you in this room believe that you're good people. And you think, well, you know, God looks at me and says I'm good. Well, that's a big distinction. Okay? That's a big difference. If you walk in this room thinking you're a good person, where the rest of us kind of go, well, I don't think I'm a good person. I feel like I've broken a lot of the commands. I deserve his punishment. And many of us in this room, we believe that God loved us so much that rather than punishing us for our sins, he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for us. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, we believe the only reason why we have eternal life is because Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. Now, some of you don't believe that. Some of you go, well, okay, that's great, but I, I don't believe I need Jesus. I've got, I, I'm good with God. I've done so many good things. I'm a good person. He's going to let me into heaven. He's going to give me eternal life because I'm so good. Listen, that is a huge difference between the two of us. And I, I, got, I got to let you know, you know what? According to what I believe, you know what I'm saying is you're not going to heaven because you have sinned against God. We all have. And you haven't lived that good life. And you've got to understand what you're saying is that Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be. You understand, there's, we live in a culture where people don't want to say we disagree. No, we all kind of believe the same thing. It's not true. If you're telling me that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God and that he didn't die on the cross for you, then you're saying that he lied. You're saying that he was a deceiver. He pretended that he was the Son of God. And he just nailed himself on the cross as a big hoax. That's a big difference from me. Because I look at Jesus and I say he's my Lord and Savior and I depend on him for my eternal salvation. You look at Jesus and you say, he's not who he claimed to be. Look, that's a big parting of ways. Okay? And, and, and what Jesus wants us to do is just to make it clear, it's, it's okay. It doesn't mean that I love you any less. But in fact, you know, some people think that, well, if you really love people, then you wouldn't be so offensive to them. And so loving you would just mean that I, I pretend that everything's okay and let you go to your grave thinking that, you know what, we're in the same boat when we're not. 
trusting in Jesus for my salvation, and I hope that you do too. And I know a lot of this stuff may be weird, it may be new to you. You may come to this room, see these people singing with their hands in the air and go, what in the world is going on here? You know what? And, and I understand that's, it is, it is kind of creepy. When you walk in and, and, and you're, if you're new to this, and you go, wow, what are they doing? And you know, all we're doing is we're singing to this God in heaven whom we believe hears us. And we're singing to him and we're telling him how much we love him because we believe he sent his son to die for us. And there was no other way for us to get into heaven. If you have any questions about that, we'd love to talk to you about that and everything else. But if you reject that, I just, again, make it clear that, you know what, you're, you're not a part of us. There is a distinction. And there is a separation there. And Jesus here is telling his disciples, it's okay to say that. It's okay to shake the dust off your feet and say, look, we, we're, we're parting ways here. We believe to totally different things. Anyways, uh, verse 6 is probably the most bizarre part of this whole passage. Okay? Because remember, Jesus is saying, go, don't take anything, just go. If they reject you, they reject you, shake your dust off, sh dust off your feet. Then look at what he does in verse 6. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. You see what he, they did? They obeyed him. Isn't that weird? <laughs> they didn't have excuses. They didn't go, well, you know what? You're not really talking to me. They just did it. I just thought that was weird. Anyways, uh... <laughs> Now, you know, sometimes, you know, we read scripture and, and we overanalyze everything and we just, you know, we, we come up with these excuses of why we don't need to tell anyone about Jesus, why we don't have to preach, or why this, you know what, the disciples didn't do that. They said, you know what, they didn't go, come on, Jesus, why can't I go back to my house and just take a few dollars with me, shekels or whatever they had, you know, why, why can't I just bring one shirt or a walking stick, I'm old, I can't do this, I can't, they just went. They just trusted. They just did it. They, they just went out because they trusted Jesus. They saw the power of God. And they said, you know what? He says he'll empower us. He'll take care of us. Let's go. And they went and they did that. Fearless. Who was fearful? Verse 7. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on. And he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead. Others that Elijah had appeared. And still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. Now, if you read the account in Mark, in Mark, it, it has Herod saying, um, in Mark 6, 16, it says, it is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Okay, Herod is hearing about all the miracles of Jesus. And he starts hearing about all these miracles taking place everywhere. And remember, Herod is that, that, that horrible ruler that beheaded John the Baptist. And so now he's getting fearful, seeing these people going around performing miracles. He goes, wow, maybe John the Baptist came back from the dead. He's afraid. He's fearful of what's going on around him. You see, it's, it's the disbelievers, the people, the unbelievers that, that, that need to fear, and, and not us. It's not us that need to, the, to, to fear any power. We've got the power of God in us. It's the people who don't understand that, that fear. You know... What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to show you a short video, four minutes long, okay? And this video, I'm showing it for two reasons. One is because this is a video of a missionary that we as a church support, okay? You guys have been supporting him. You don't even know him. A lot of times you guys, you know, you, you see our missions budget, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you go, well, who does that go to? Well, I'm showing you this video because here's one of the guys it goes to. But the second reason why I'm showing you this video why I'm showing you this guy is because he is so old, okay? Now, now, and I say this in a wonderful way, okay? I say this because he's at the end of his life, okay? He was here this week, and, um, and there's just something so powerful about the testimony of an older man who just says, you know what? 